So applying graph theory to infrastructure as code. So sitting in between you and the closing happy hour is a nice healthy dose of graph theory. Uh, <laughs> It's really not going to be that bad, I promise. Uh, and uh, and a, a little bit of infrastructure as code as well. We're going to kind of dig into what infrastructure as code means. Um, and we're going to mash them together uh, in Terraform's core. So we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive through Terraform's core. It's going to be awesome. So we're going to start with infrastructure as code. So one of the things that um, has been interesting to me is it's, this is a phrase that we use quite a bit. Uh, and it's got sort of like a very simple definition. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, code to manage infrastructure. Um, and, but, but it's got a ton of implications. And so I wanted to, to sort of dig into this definition and put it in a little bit of a historical context. So no conversation about uh, DevOps, no presentation about a DevOps topic is complete without a incredibly editorialized, arbitrarily sliced up timeline of history. So that's what we're gonna do in a couple of different, in five different steps, because this picture has five steps. Uh, so in the beginning, there was manual everything. Uh, you know, uh, the, the part of the operator's job in, in building out infrastructure included physically racking servers, opening boxes, lifting things. Um, I'm actually really curious. Uh, so if, in the last 30 days, if you have physically touched server class hardware, can you raise your hand? Oh, it's so small at this group. That's really interesting. Uh, so, um, and in my experience, those folks kind of split across two, uh, into two different camps. You get the one, pe one people who are raising their hand, they're like, yeah, I still have to do procurement, and I still have to netboot, and I really wish I didn't have to deal with network drivers. Um, and then you get the other people who are like, you, can take, you can't take this metal from my cold, dead hands. I need my, I need my cores, not CPU shares. Um, so uh, this was the beginning. Um, and you, you, you move forward, folks got good at racking and stacking servers. They got better at it, they developed practices around it. They began to automate pieces of the job um, with, with um, scripting languages to get from a uh, brand new out of the box server to a server performing uh, an actual useful uh, thing for your business. So this is an era where uh, there wasn't a lot of collaboration, a lot of, uh, and there wasn't a lot of communication amongst groups. So you get a lot of bespoke scripting, uh, a lot of uh, sort of spe uh, company-specific tooling, and a lot of repeated work. Um, so along with the wave of machine virtualization, which lifted up, uh, lifted up machines into software, where you could run a machine inside of a machine, we also got an, an increase in automation, um, an increase in collaboration as well. So this is where uh, I kind of class in with this stage, uh, sort of configuration management tooling um, began to be mature and sort of a little bit more of an industry standard um, to be using something like Puppet or Chef to, uh, to configure your machines. Once you get the technology for resource utilization, you move forward into commoditizing that. So that's where, we're, this is the era we're basically in with, uh, with cloud resources uh, that are drivable via APIs, that, by public APIs. More technology, more layers of virtualization, more software, and also more automation. So more capability to automate away some of the more rote tasks that we're doing. And, the place that we're entering is data center as computer, where you can, instead of uh, taking the uh, machine as a object, you start to just talk about the resources required to run uh, an application, and you let the data center, you let a cluster of machines figure out where to run it. So uh, we get better resource utilization this way, we get uh, cap the capability to do more automation, um, and theoretically we have to do less work overall. So if you take a look at sort of the, the stages of increasing automation and increasing uh, virtualization here, theoretically this should be a story of maturity, right? This should be a story where each step gets us something new, each step makes our lives better. So my question is, why doesn't it feel that way sometimes? Uh, it's, it can be really painful, and, I, and if you don't believe me, you have to look at DevOps humor, right? Like, if you, take, if you take a look at the humor in our industry, it's so, it's so pessimistic. Uh, it's, um, and if you don't, yeah, if you don't follow these, these parody Twitter accounts, they're so good. Um, you get those laughs that, like, that make you cry. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, 
dissonance in this, you know, this, this march of technology progress with this sort of increased feeling of losing control. So thinking about this problem or this, this what, what, what is happening here, I've sort of developed a thesis of, of, uh, of a way of describing it. So the, basically we gain a capability. A technology gives us a capability, but that capability comes with complexity. And those things happen at the same time. In order to get the capability, we, uh, we have to accept the complexity. And then, now that we have, are able to do something new, we have a new problem, and the new problem is to manage that complexity. Thinking about complexity in infrastructure, like, it's very easy to see, right? It's very easy to see uh, why we get those parity Twitter accounts. Um, this is a ostensibly standard web application, right? Um, there are 50, 50 different things happening right there. Um, and so that's where I put my definition of infrastructure as code. It's a strategy for managing the complexity that comes with all of, these, all of this increased tooling and automation that we have at our fingertips now. So what, how, what, is, what, is, uh, what is the strategy that infrastructure as code takes? It basically says, hey, wait a second, we actually have some really complicated systems right over there that we've got teams with years of experience managing that complexity. And those are software systems. And if you take a look at what's been happening in our industry, we've been lifting up all of our problems from opening a box physically to, into a software problem. And we've you know, gotten a bunch of capability in doing that, but now we have problems with the complexity. And so if we take a look at you know, the software system on the right, I think that's Drupal. It's the ER diagram for Drupal. Um, you, start to see some, uh, you start to see some similarities, right? Um, and so that's what infrastructure as code is. So saying, hey, the folks who are managing that complexity, how do they do it? it? Turns out they use code. Why do they use code? Well, code, it turns out, has a bunch of great properties uh, in, um, well, it's not just the code, right? It's the entire practice of managing the complexity of software. Um, so that's essentially what infrastructure as code is, is to say the folks who've been writing software have been managing complexity this entire time. We also have to manage complexity. Let's see if we can't borrow a bunch of the, the tooling, the practices, and the benefits that the software community has gotten um, from uh, managing their complexity as code. So, um, and that's where you get all of the, you know, the, the sort of tenets of infrastructure as code, right? Um, you know, versioned, versioned plain text declarations of your complexity, self-testing systems, um, you know, declarative, declarative uh, modeling of the complexity, and, uh, you know, sh sharing, sharing of the details of the complexity in a consistent format with everybody. Um, so all, all sorts of details there. But for me, that was, this is when it really clicked, was to say, ah, this is, this is, uh, it's, it's a transfer of knowledge from the software that we know that we have to run up on our servers down to the software that we're using to manage those servers. So this is the place that Terraform lives. Terraform is an infrastructure as code tool. Um, and so that, um, th that sort of gives you a little bit of context as to what I say when I mean infrastructure as code. So now we need a crash course in graph theory so, so that we can dive into Terraform's core. That sounds really scary, but it's not going to be. It looks scary, actually, if I show it to you this way, which is graph theory is a division of combinatorics, which is actually under discrete mathematics. Um, and uh, the, you know, it, it sounds scary. What's great about graph theory is a couple of examples that are very composable will really give you the ability to, uh, to know and understand the, the basics enough to be able to be dangerous in graph theory. So that's what we'll do. Um, this is just gonna be a bunch of examples that fit together. So, you have, a, you have a vertex or a node. You can use those interchangeably. Uh, you can connect them together. That's an edge. You can uh, have an edge that, has a, that is either undirected or directed. So, um, and then you can have it, a graph that includes edges that are either directed or undirected, and you'd call it a directed or an undirected graph. So these are all very abstract concepts. In a directed graph, you can have a cycle so that is a path that both begins and ends at the same node. And uh, when a graph has no cycles, it is called acyclic. So you put those together, you have a directed acyclic graph, and everybody who knows Git knows that that's part of, that's deeply part of Git's worldview, is the DAG. 
But you can see it's really just based on these very simple concepts that you put together. So a couple of other terms that we need to know in order to, in order to understand how Terraform uses graph is, uh, so a walk is a uh, operation that you perform on a graph where you visit each node. So uh, you basically, like th those numbers represent sort of an ordering. Um, a walk can be in any order. This walk happens to follow, uh, the, follow the edges of the graph. Again, abstract concepts, right? So it's, it doesn't matter, what, what does a visit mean? Um, that, that, comes, that, that comes in your application. As you're talking just about a graph, you're just saying, I visited the node. A parallel walk is something that we're gonna talk very specifically about in Terraform, where, um, that, and this sort of demonstrates the fact that a walk is just an abstract operation, where uh, you can actually visit multiple nodes at the same time. And finally, a graph transform is the, is the last operation you need to understand in order to, but before we dive into Terraform's core. So a graph transform is an operation that takes a graph as input and it produces a graph as output. So um, it might change the graph in some way. And by changing the graph, we just saw all of the pieces that, that a transform can do. It can add or delete edges. It can add or delete nodes. It can change edges. Um, and that's essentially what a transform is. It lives in a very, like, very specific space. It's a purely functional operation, which is very nice. Um, and it's, uh, it's going to be very important as we show you how Terraform uses graph theory in its core. So, okay, so there you go, that's it. Just a couple of minutes, a couple of examples, and it's pretty easy to see, going back to this picture, why graph theory might be valuable here. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, that does kind of look, that looks pretty good. Um, modeling infrastructure as a graph uh, turns out to give us a ton of benefits that we're going to see. And that's where Terraform comes in. This is Terraform's reason for being. So uh, let's talk, so we're gonna make our way down to where the graph lives in Terraform's core. We're gonna, it's gonna require a couple of levels uh, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of go down level by level until we get to the part where the graph is, and then we can talk about, talk about that in context. So this is a basic, uh, basic uh, layout of Terraform's internals. It has a core, um, that, that's where we're gonna be. And then it has a bunch of providers, which you've heard, uh, any of you who've been at the Terraform talks that involve providers, you know about those. And the pro providers are the plugins that interact with upstream APIs some terminology that'll be helpful as we start talking about these things. So the core speaks a, um, a very declarative API, diff, apply, and refresh. Um, and the providers uh, are that translation la layer between a declarative API and the classic sort of CRUD API that most uh, cloud providers are gonna provide. And then, so, understanding how Terraform looks at the world is really just understanding a couple of basic concepts. So these are all capital letter uh, terminology because they're part of Terraform's domain model. So in Terraform, a config is provided by the user. It represents a target reality. State is something that's recorded by Terraform after performing an operation, representing its view of current reality. And then uh, the, the, uh, these two bits sort of compose to show you those three verbs that Terraform cares about. Diff is taking a config and comparing it with the state to say, um, how would I get to the target reality? And then a plan just presents that diff to you, and then an apply takes the operations to resolve the diff such that um, there is, there's no longer a diff. So this is Terraform's view of the world, um, and understanding these concepts, you basically understand how Terraform thinks. So within core, Terraform has a bunch of different packages to divide up responsibilities. Uh, the, at the top here, we have sort of the core package that's actually called Terraform. Uh, we have a separate package for reading config um, that's responsible for translating the, uh, the HCL of the files that you write of Terraform config into a memory a stru uh, uh, structure in memory. So uh, config does that, hands it off to Terraform, and then Terraform makes a graph. And it uses a separate package called DAG to make that graph. And this really provides a very nice isolation because what we, what we do, do is 
all of the graph theoretical concepts that we just walked through are implemented only in the DAG package. And Terraform interacts with the DAG package, so we can actually verify that um, in, in, in a relatively small amount of code that we're doing the correct thing in a very well-tested uh, abstract environment, and Terraform is the package that applies the meaning to that graph. So, so we say, okay, so Terraform, the Terraform package reads for the, the config, and then it makes the graph. How does it make the graph? It does that with a series of graph transforms. So uh, if you go down into the Terraform package, you'll find a graph builder op uh, object. And the graph builder is essentially, um, it's uh, just a list of graph transforms. So the first transform starts with an empty graph. We have nothing. And it's called the config transformer, and it's responsible for taking in the config from the user and then producing the first step of the graph. So that's gonna take everything that you've written into your file, all the resources that you'd like to be created, um, and it's gonna do, it's gonna already uh, connect some basic lines for you. So if you were to zoom into that, um, here's, here's an example of, a really simple example of uh, an AWS instance behind a load balancer, and then uh, a DN simple record to point to that. So this, this is a nice uh, visualization of the fact that from a Terraform's perspective, it does not care that we're talking to two different providers. That's all outside of core. From, from core's perspective, these are just the names of the nodes. And then um, based on th what resources it finds in the graph, it's also gonna drop some provider nodes. That's what those nodes are on the bottom. Um, so the provider nodes essentially are responsible for setting up the SDK, uh, setting up, you know, doing any sort of authent authentication step. But you'll notice that they're sort of hanging out there on the graph. And uh, the very next transform is just responsible for connecting them up. So it, uh, it goes over the resources and it makes them depend on the provider nodes. So this is what's gonna allow the, uh, the SDKs to be set up before we do any talking to the resources. So, so on and so forth, we, there are probably 25 or 30 transforms. Each of them has a really isolated job and makes it very easy to test. And what you get at the end is a root transformer. So we, you know, we, can't go, we don't have time to go through all of the transforms, but you can, you can kind of start to picture what happens, which is um, some, some of the transforms modify the graph in certain ways. Um, so the, some, some of the transforms talk, uh, try to understand where, where destroys are going to happen. So you have to, you have to put a destroy node earlier than you have to put a create node. Um, but yeah, so that's, but they're all, what's nice is they all have this exact same interface, this functional interface of graph goes in, graph comes out, usually slightly differently, unless, you know, sometimes, not, sometimes nothing happens. But uh, it's all very, uh, it's all very, uh, there's a lot of symmetry everywhere. So at the very end, we have the root transformer that just makes sure that there's a single place to start our walks. So if there are any graphs, uh, any nodes that don't have any dependence, uh, we, add, we add one node and point it to those. So here we go, here's our completed example graph. Again, like in the real world, there are a couple of extra logical nodes in here, but this is essentially what's happening. And then what we, have, what we do is we walk it. So um, Terraform pr performs a parallel walk on the, starting from the root and then working its way upwards. And what's really awesome about this parallel walk is it makes as much progress as it can um, based, on, uh, based on the dependencies. So, Anybody who's ever interacted with cloud APIs knows that they are variously performant, let's say. Um, and what, what's great about this is we can make as much progress as possible without, without having to think about that. Um, we just wait for each dependent operation to happen, um, and we will do as much as we can in parallel. And what's cool about this is the uh, Terraform package resp is responsible for what happens when you visit, but the actual walk itself is handled by the DAG package. So te the Terraform core has, doesn't have to know at all about this parallel walk. All it has to do is set up the dependencies properly and hand the function down to the DAG package that it would like to be called um, for each node. It works out very nicely. So now, so that, that's sort of a basic understanding of Terraform's internal use of the graph. 
And this is, so, this is where we get to sort of the meat of the question, which is like, why, 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 why do this? And there's a really quite a long list of, of benefits that we get. So a couple of important ones. This one I've touched on quite a bit already, which is a solid separation of concerns. And the idea that we can get a really tightly, tightly uh, um, cohesive and well-tested package that deals in these graph, graph theoretical concepts and utilize that from the Terraform layer allows us to build a system that's uh, much more stable than it would otherwise be. The, uh, the, I can't gush enough about the parallel walk. <laughs> uh, it's just, it's, it's provi it provides just all sorts of uh, performance benefits with just such a minimal um, layer of complexity. Um, the fact that we use Go means we basically ju can just kick off a bunch of Go routines um, and let, their, let them wait for their own dependencies and everything just sort of, everything just sort of happens. It's beautiful. Uh, and then this, this piece is, is really important. So graph the, like by basing our, the core of Terraform on an, an existing body of knowledge, we get a whole host of solutions that we can borrow from people who have been doing thinking about graph theory, mathematicians who have been doing work on abstract graphs to try to answer questions. So this is, a, is an example that is implemented in Terraform. Uh, the uh, transitive reduction. So you can essentially, you can see it visually here, but basically what happens is, and this was actually true of Terraform's graph for a long time, um, every node expressed the superset of its dependencies. And so you can see here like A depends on B, C, uh, uh, B, C and E, right? Um, but what ends up happening in terms of the order that you walk um, is what's on the right. Right? In order to satisfy all those dependencies, you really need to walk in a, in a very specific order. Um, so uh, from a walking perspective, those two graphs are equivalent, but from an understanding perspective, visualizing those graphs and debugging those graphs, it's a lot easier to debug a graph on the right. Um, and so there's a well-known algorithm for this that you, we, could, we literally just copied the pseudocode from, from Wikipedia, implemented it in Go, tested it, tested it thoroughly, uh, and down in the DAG package that has, that has nothing to do, you know, is probably 50 lines of code, maybe, maybe a couple hundred lines of test. Um, and we got, we got this benefit of a proven algorithm that makes, makes all, every graph that Terraform produces simpler. And that really, like, kind of grounds the entire project. So this, to me, is sort of the... It's the antidote to the, the ennui of all of this complexity, which is remember that there are bodies of knowledge that folks have been building for a long time and see if the problem that you're trying to solve might line up with one of those existing bodies of knowledge. That's what we found in Terraform. We said an infrastructure is like a graph, um, and if we bake a graph into Terraform, what we get is a solid theoretical grounding. We, can implement concepts that we know work, but it also gives us all of this, this whole vast library of solutions to real problems that we have. And we're really only just scratching the surface of what we can do, uh, what we can do by borrowing more graph theoretical uh, ideas and algorithms. So um, you, can find, you can find me anywhere at the conference and I'm happy to talk about those. Like we, so Terraform does, like for, just as one example, Terraform does nothing with cost yet. And if you start thinking about, so there's all this, all this graph theoretical work on cost, right? Um, right now, all of the edges we talked about are just you know, plain edges, plain connections. But cost is where you attach a number to each edge. Um, and so you can do some really interesting things if you start to think about uh, predictive algorithms that you can do to say, what, if, what, 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 what sort of optimizations, optimizations can I perform if I know that this is going to be more expensive than that? Um, so yeah, all sorts of stuff we can geek out about if you find me. Um, but that's sort of, you know, the, the, the concept there is by finding a body of knowledge that's, that's, uh, that's related to the problem we're trying to solve, we... Found, found ourselves f very stable grounding for our tool, and uh, we got all sorts of very specific benefits in, um, in the uh, stability and testability and composability of, the pro of our problem set, or of our solution set for the problem, 
And we have this whole wonderful body of knowledge that we can go and play around in and borrow, borrow concepts to, to make Terraform even better. So that, that's all I have for you. Thank you very much.